like I said, let me lay out some context and culture. Remember as we're walking through this, wherever they are, and we don't know in the, in the letter to the Hebrews, they are undergoing persecutions and temptations. There are external pressures. Uh, there is the pressure of culture. They lived in a Jewish culture, and yet they're laying hold of Jesus Christ, and so there is the animosity there between a religious culture and Christianity. Uh, there are also social pressures as they become more and more worldly, Hellenistic views, if you know what that is, is creeping in. And so the church is laying a hold of some of those views from Rome. And so they've got those pressures as well. And then there is just the tiredness that they're going through. If you have your Bibles in Hebrews 5, put a finger there and then run over very quickly to Hebrews 10 and look at what the writer here says in verse 32. Hebrews 10, 32, the writer says, Remember the former days when after being enlightened you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. You showed those persecuted sympathy, sympathy to the prisoners and you accepted joyfully the seizure of your property knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. So they've already walked through some difficult times. They've lost property. They've lost jobs. They've lost friendships and relationships and family. And here they still stand clinging to Christ and their Christianity. It's getting long, Lord. How, li- how long do we have to trudge through this life and hold on to you when so much seems to be getting stripped away from us. So when you begin to add all those up as a picture, and Granite Church, we haven't walked through that last scene, have we? But when we begin to lump all that together as one picture, it begins to allow complacency and apathy to creep into the hearts of the believers. And so this is a very strong warning, if you will, or an exhortation to these people to hold fast to Christ. Don't you dare, remember chapter 2, verse 1, don't you dare drift away. Don't you dare even consider allowing your faith to slide back into apathy and complacency where Christ, in effect, has no effect whatsoever in your life. And so look with me at, at three, three one. Let's look at just a few of these hard warnings that we see in the midst of all this because I want to Draw what's on the outside before we look on what's on the inside. Look at 3.1 very quickly. He says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus. Look at verse 6. Chapter 3. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are if we hold fast our confidence in the boast of our hope firm until the end. Look down at 3.14. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. Look at 4.1. Therefore let us fear if while a promise remains of entering His rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. One more, look down in 4.14. Therefore since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. He's just hammering them with this idea that you better cling to Christ in the midst of your slide. Now, if anything we could agree on this morning, I think we could universally agree that there is a slide in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I had a meeting with several men this morning, and that was the consensus of the group individually. But I would say, be so bold as to say, as a church... There is this constant pull from culture or from our uh, society to drag us away from our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is constant. It is never ending. It is relentless. If you're awake, there's a pull that pulls you away from your relationship with Christ. But it's not just our context, right? It's the broader church context as a whole. It is definitely slid. And that may be a prideful statement, but when I look at the bigger picture, there is a definite slide from those who profess Christianity, particularly in this culture, right? I'm not talking about the world, church. I'm talking about us. 
we are constantly, seemingly sliding away from our relationship with Christ. So we have all these warnings that surround this. Now look in the middle, if you will, at the best part, the donut. Look at what he uses, and I don't want us to miss this. Look at what he uses to grab a hold of their attention in the midst of their slide. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. The writer says, Therefore, let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest. He brings in a new subject. Any one of you may seem to have come short of it, for indeed we have had good news preached to us, just as they also, meaning the Old Testament, but the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest. Just as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. They shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, those who have formerly had good news preached to them fell to enter because of disobedience. Now look down in verse 9. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has also rested from his works. Don't let me lose you right here. When the writer begins to speak of the rest of God, he begins to speak of the presence of God. When God finished his creation in Genesis chapter 2, he entered into his rest that he continues in today. And our goal as believers is to enter into that rest. That's not the focus. With God. That's the focus. He's our treasure. We just sang that. He's our reward. He is the fulfillment of every lasting joy that we can ever experience. And so our goal, what He is drawing from, and what I want to draw on this morning is to long for the rest with God in His presence for all eternity, and that will stop our sliding away from our relationship with Jesus Christ. Because the only way that we can enter into that rest is through the person of Christ. And so we dearly cling to Christ, longing for the presence of God and the rest of God. Does that make sense? Here's our problem this morning. I just communicated something to you intellectually that you don't know spiritually. We don't value the infinite worth of our Lord Jesus Christ. We simply do not even comprehend the joy and the peace and the delight to have and to be in the presence of God. We seek such simple, foolish pleasures that try to satisfy us, that we are convinced, obviously, that satisfy us. But every time we prove, time and time and time again, those things are short in our satisfaction. It's not the pleasure that we thought. It's not the joy. And like climbing a ladder that never ends, we keep climbing and climbing and climbing, convinced that at the top of that ladder, we're going to find what we've been looking for. And it's simply not there. The only place that we can find what we're looking for is in that relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why he puts that in the middle. And that's why we look at it and we scratch our heads and go, what in the world? So what is it that we need to understand that the writer of Hebrews is trying to communicate to us that we need to persevere in our pursuit of Christ and in our delight of Christ. And I can tell by the look on your faces because it's the same look on my heart. What? What? Men talk about their call. I have one. You're like, good. <laughs> um, mine is very clear. It came at an early age, and even though I've been confused about it from time to time, God has been faithful to bring me back to the passage where he called me, where Ezra set his heart to study, to observe, and to teach. Those three things. 
God always brings me back to that in times of confusion. Son, remember what I told you. Study, observe, teach. What's the middle one? Observe. My teaching and preaching is an overflow of two things. Study and observance. In other words, if I'm not walking in obedience, my teaching and preaching is not, is not going to bubble over. It's going to leak out. Okay? I can't preach to you from observance this morning. And I realize that. I'm trying to communicate something to you that I don't quite grasp, and I know you don't either. There might be some in here that when I speak of the joys of the Lord, you just go off somewhere into this longing place. But I kind of doubt it. Now, I have met a few people in my life that are that way. I met, when we worked in the Northwest uh, with Troy Smith, I met his mom. How old was she? 80s? At the foot of her bed, her mattress, was there was a dip in it. And her son had told me this. And he said, Mom, don't you need to get a new mattress? And she said, oh, no. I wore that out. He said, how in the world did you wear a dip out on the edge of your mattress? And she said, pray. Her elbows had done that at the foot of her bed, pressed into her mattress every day as she went into the presence of God. There's a few people I've met like that, that when I begin to speak about the joys of the Lord, they just, they're gone. Hello, nobody home. I want to be there. I really do. And as much as that, I want you to be there. Let, but we're not, so... Let's rely on somebody who was. T turn, keep your finger there and go back to Psalms 36. I'm, I'm sorry, Psalm 63. I want you to listen to these words. You will think I am speaking a foreign language to you, but I promise I'm not. It's just the words of somebody that's enamored with God. Absolutely enamored. And I wish that I could feel this way. I wish that I could speak this way. But we'll just have to rely upon the text this morning. Psalm 63, let me begin in verse 1. I'm going to read, I guess I'll read about all of it. You just listen. Oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water, Thus, look at his vision, I have seen you in the sanctuary. I've seen your power and your glory. Look at verse 3. Because your loving kindness is better than what? Life. You see that? My lips will praise you. I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness. My mouth offers praises with joyful lips. Look at verse 6. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. For you have been my help. In the shadow of your wings, I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Where does the guy get words like that? It's a man who deeply loves and longs for his God. And if anything is going to correct our slide as individuals and as a church, it is a love for God. It is a profound, indescribable feeling. You know how I'm about feelings. But it's a feeling that's there that wants to be with the Lord. It's so much so that death, when it begins to come for you, also brings a smile. And almost enthusiasm within your heart to know that soon my joy will be realized. My faith will become my sight. And I will see my God.
that's where we got to get. You can't get there by a program. You can't get there by preaching. You can't get there by singing. The only way you'll get there is by the grace of God. It'll even take grace to give you that desire in your heart to want to even get to this place. Because we're still flesh and we are so spoiled rotten by sin. We actually think that what I just described can be achieved by other means. We actually think that those experiences and that joy can be achieved financially, relationally, positionally, all kinds of things in this world. And don't think you're not convinced of that. Look at how you live your life. That gives testimony that you're convinced of that. We need to learn deeply what this writer of Hebrews is trying to communicate to us so that we will firm up, if you will, our grasp on the Lord Jesus Christ and our pursuit of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he does in chapter 5. He begins to tell us what Christ has done for us and the way that he did that. This is all still introduction, by the way. And the way that he did that, so we'll look at life and then we'll look at Christ and realize the radical calls that he makes to us that you don't hear much in the church today. The dying to self, the radical holiness that you pursue, the leaving aside of everything in this life and just running toward Jesus of every moment, of every day, of every circumstance. You begin to view life as opportunities that you grab a hold of for His glory and you begin to seek after Him. I only want Him. And so you even enter into the most mundane of tasks. Whatever that is, work or whatever, you enter into the most mundane of tasks seeking His glory and seeking to know Him more. And so everything becomes overshadowed by, you will, of this great glory that you begin to pursue. That's where we've got to get. Now, strangely enough, go back to Hebrews 5 now. He's going to communicate that to us by speaking about a high priest. We enter the subject of the high priest. You're like... Dude, did you just change subjects? And I'm like, no. Through the high priest is exactly how we get to this place. And let me show you. First of all, let me answer this question. Well, I'll tell you what. Let me read just first four verses. Chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Every high priest is taken from among men and is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant, misguided, since he himself also is beset with weakness. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins as for the people, so also for himself. And no one takes this honor to himself, but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. And then verse 5, the first three words, so also Christ. And then he begins to reiterate all of that in the image of Christ. So, okay, pastor, here's where we're going. And remember, I hadn't been there, so this is difficult for me. I've got to go to all that glorious thought that we just talked about and bring it into the context of how in the world does the writer go to Christ being our high priest and how does that satisfy all that? All right, so let's go. If you have the law, which God gave, you have to have a high priest. Why? If you have the law, what are you and I going to do to the law? We're going to break it. In fact, while God was giving the law, we'll see in just a second, we were breaking the law. And the moment that we broke God's holy law was the moment that our relationship with Christ was separated. God in His grace, while Moses was receiving the law, received the instruction about the high priest. I'm sure Moses is going, okay, what's this guy going to do? He's the guy that intercedes on our behalf. 
He's the guy that makes payment for that breaking of the law to make propitiation for us so that we might be reconciled back to God. Because God knows that our satisfaction, our peace, our joy can only be found in Him. So I'm going to give you the law to represent how holy I am. I know what you're going to do with that law. You're going to break that law. You're going to disobey that law. You're going to ignore that law. And you're going to separate yourself from the only thing that can satisfy you. Therefore, I'm going to give you a high priest. They don't know they need this. I'm going to give you a high priest. And he's going to make intercession. And he's going to make propitiation. He's going to pay for your <coughs> foolishness. So you can be returned to your joy. Now what kind of God does that? There's only one, right? So let's go back to Exodus chapter 20. And walk through a few things. Drop a, drop a pen on Hebrews 5. And let's go back to Exodus chapter 20. I promise we're going to get back to infinite joy. But this is the path that God took in Hebrews. So we're going to take it too. Exodus 20 is the Ten Commandments. I just want to point out one of them. Look at Exodus 20, verse 3. I'm sorry, verse 4. Exodus 20, verse 4. You're familiar with the Ten Commandments. Verse 4, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. Now, what are the children of Israel just about to do. Make a golden calf. I mean, they're on the doorstep of making an image that God just said, don't you dare. Go to the right with me to Exodus chapter 28. You're going to see the high priest office begin to form. Moses is still up on the mountain. He's still receiving the law of God. And he says to him, probably what Moses felt might like might be a little bit confusing, but look at chapter 28, verse 1. Then bring near to yourself Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him. Notice this phrase, from among the sons of Israel to minister as priest to me. So we see the first requirement or qualification of the high priest is he must be from among the people. Okay? Turn to chapter 29, verse 1. Second qualification. Now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them, meaning Aaron and his sons, to minister as priests to me. Second qualification, not only did they have to be among the people, they had to be called of God. God says, set these aside, they're mine. Look down in verse 9. You shall gird them with sashes, Aaron and his sons, and bind caps on them, and they shall have the priesthood by a perpetual state. He'll always be from the line of Aaron. Now, here's what's interesting. Chapter 28, chapter 29, chapter 30 is all about one subject. The high priest. Now look what's fascinating. The last thing that God says before He speaks of the golden calf, look at chapter 31, verse 12. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, this is the last statement, As for you, speak to the sons of Israel saying, you shall surely observe my Sabbath. Remember, we talked about rest. And in God's rest, what do we find? God. Look at what he says. You shall surely observe my Sabbath, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Therefore, you are to observe the Sabbath, for it is holy to you. Now look at chapter 32, verse 1. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. This is what I find so striking as you're going back to Hebrews chapter 5 now. While God was telling him, 
This is what a high priest is, and this is what a high priest does. The children of Israel were breaking the law of God. He is the one that's going to intercede for you. He is the one that's going to reconcile our relationship. And by the way, our relationship now currently stands broken. And you know Moses was probably like, do what? And God says, they're making a golden calf. And they already had the Ten Commandments. Now, something else very interesting about this high priest, if you're in Hebrews chapter 5, look with me now at verse 2. The high priest needs to be gentle so he can deal gently with the ignorant and the misguided since he himself also is beset with weakness. Do you realize the first time Aaron, which is over in Leviticus had to go in and atone for the sins of the people, guess whose sin he also had to atone for? His own. In fact, Moses told him, Aaron, you sacrifice, and I want you to go in there, and I want you to atone for your own sin. And while he sat there sacrificing that animal, it had to have crossed his mind, oh God, after you gave the law, I am responsible for leading the entire nation into sin. I'm the one that made that golden calf with their earrings and their necklaces and their gold. I'm the one that led them to bow down to a false god. God, please forgive me. He had a tough job. And once he received forgiveness for his own sin, then he had to receive forgiveness for the people. Now, God had all this rigged, y'all. Because for a man to walk in there that doesn't need to pay for his own sin, how's he going to feel toward people who have sinned? God, I don't know what you're going to do with this bunch. They're about as ignorant as they can get. See, I can't ever get mad at y'all. If I ever get mad at you, I've got to get mad at who? I've got to get mad at me first. Because I'm no different than y'all. So that was the role of the high priest. He had to be from among the people. He had to be called of God. And he had to be gentle, remembering that he's got to pay for himself before he can ever pay for anybody else. Now, last thing. I'll pick it up. Enter Christ. Hebrews chapter 5. Look at verse 5. So also Christ did. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become high priest, but he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Just as he also said in another passage, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Don't worry about that. We'll come back to that in chapter 7. Look at verse 7. In chap yeah, chapter 7. Now look at chapter 5, verse 7. That's confusing. In the days of his flesh, first requirement met. Remember? In John, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You remember that? Chapter 7. In the days of his flesh, Jesus was among us. First qualification. Check. We're good. He offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience. My goodness, we'll come back to that. He learned obedience from the thing which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Second check, verse 10. Being designated by God as a high priest... Check number two. He was among the people and he was called by God. He didn't say, I'm the son of God. I'm here. I'll take the job. No. God said, he has fulfilled the requirement. He is your high priest from the order of Melchizedek, which we'll get to eternal. There will never be another high priest. He's it. Okay? 
Melchizedek. I know Audrey's freaking out over here. Melchizedek, sorry. So first qualification, among the people, boom. Second qualification, called of God. The Son of God allowed Himself to be called. Third qualification, remember the third one? Remember Aaron walking in, I got to make atonement for the first time, and oh yeah, Aaron, you're the one who, thank you. How in the world is Jesus going to deal with that? How is He going to be gentle? How is He going to offer sacrifices for us when He's never experienced sin? He never sinned, right? So how in the world can He be understanding? How can He be sympathetic? How can He be broken for us if He's never walked a mile in our shoes? Let's go back and look at verse 8. Sorry, verse 7. In the days of His flesh He offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying. Can you picture the Lord doing that? With loud crying and tears to the One who is able to save Him from death. And He was heard because of His piety. Now listen, He wasn't praying for physical death because Scripture there says God heard Him and He died. So He wasn't praying, God keep me from dying. Because it says God heard and then He died. It wasn't as if God said, Son, I heard you. Sorry. That's not the point. Keep reading and you'll understand the point. Although He was a son, He learned obedience from the things which He suffered and He was made perfect. Now, when you and I try to train our kids, they need to learn obedience because they are what? Disobedient. That's not the case with the Son of God. He was always obedient, but God's now going to run him through the ringers and he's going to experience the fullness of what it means to be obedient. Son, you say you're obedient. Certainly in the Gospel of John, we saw that. I came to do his will, not my will. Jesus was fully obedient. But now let's test him. Let's run him through the fullest experience where obedience will become, or where obedience will come to the point to where it might break. I used to have a Sunday school teacher that was, oh, he loved to play the devil, devil's advocate, Kip Williamson. And he would always ask us this question, could Jesus have sinned? I used to think, that's a dumb question. What does that matter? He paid for our sins. But we see here in Hebrews 5, oh yeah. Oh yeah. With loud crying and tears. And remember the Garden of Gethsemane? What did he pray? Not my will, but your will. What was God's will for Jesus? To be a perfect, spotless sacrifice for God. That was his will. What was Jesus tempted with? To not be a perfect spotless, sinless sacrifice for God. What was he broken in prayer for? <coughs> to be exactly what God had called him to be. He didn't have to sin to experience the fullness of sin. If you want to experience the fullness of obedience, you must obey to the very end. That's a full experience of sin. You and I give up way too short and we don't experience the fullness of the difficulty and the strain to walk in obedience because we so easily fold. You ever had to run high, uh, suicides in high school? Remember when the coach said run 20? Five into it, somebody stops and pukes and they're out. Did they get the fullness of 20? No. Ten into it, somebody pulls up with a hamstring. You always thought, buddy, you're faking it. He's out. Did he get the full 20? No. Two to go, somebody falls so far behind. They say, Coach, I can't. And he goes over the steps, he sits down. He's out. But you keep going. And you tap that line on the 20th and you stand up. And you look around and you're the only one. Who experienced the fullness of that? The guy who finished. Everybody else fell short. 
We can never look at Jesus Christ and go, you don't understand because you never sin. Oh, no. He understands more because he never sinned. All the way to the cross, he died, and he never sinned. Look with me at chapter 4, verse 15. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet, what church? Without sin. He knows things we don't even know about. He knows how to bleed and die in the temptation of sin and satisfy the will of God. He is a perfect high priest that understands more than the line of Aaron ever understood. And he understands us exactly where we are in the midst of our sin as we begin to slide. Last thing. How in the world did Jesus do that? He's God. No. No, he did it in the days of his flesh. He was fully God, but he allowed himself to be fully man. How did he do that? Go back to chapter 5. Look at verse 7. In the days of his flesh, he offered up prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. So here's my question. How are you going to stop the slide? How are you going to cling to Christ in the midst of a culture that pulls you away, amidst of a society that's falling apart, amidst of a church that's broken and fragmented, amidst of so many pulls in line. How are you going to choose Christ day in and day out and grab hold of His holiness, knowing that He's the only thing that satisfies? How are you going to do that? Go back to chapter 4, verse 16. The second prayer in all of this. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Same place the sun went, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. I wish I was there. I want to be there. I want to write like Psalm 63. I want you to write like Psalm 63. When I talk about the joy of the Lord, I want you to just light up and go somewhere else. You go, oh, shouldn't have said that, I've lost him. We can get there. We really can. Jesus stayed there. He never lost sight of that. But he agonized in prayer in his relationship with the Lord. To get there, we're going to have to do the same thing. We're going to have to agonize and pursue and cry out to God in prayer to let us know what it's like for him to be our all-satisfying, all-delightful joy to where everything else in this life is just waste. Let's pray.